policie. You mean like when after we introduce ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, huh? Yeah. How are you? So good. We don't need to all give it up in the Good to see you. Once we get down here. Well, yeah, I mean, if something pops in your head that that yeah. helps them to understand what it, That's awesome. you know, what. Where are you guys getting your you know, like, I didn't write in there the classifications. Yeah. You know, that's it. You know. Whenever you're ready. Whenever we're ready? Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. We didn't know what to expect, if there was gonna be one person or a bunch, so we appreciate you guys coming. I wanna point out that it's obviously the most fun project at the fair, so yes. I'm excited to see so many people here to learn more about pigs. Yes, so my name is Linda Cedarbloom. I'm a swine leader in Ramsey Raiders 4-H Club. I've been a leader for I, I don't even know how many years, at least 25 years. And I had four kids go through the 4-H um, program, and now I have grandkids in the 4-H program, and I lead um, Swine and Ramsey Raiders, and w we try to limit our club to 20 kids because it's what we feel like we can manage, because we, you know, it's, we just feel like that's what we can do a good job at, so we personally keep our club at, tw at 20. So it's safe to say that, um, well, we're all Ramsey Raider leaders, but it's safe to say we're quite obsessed with the pig project. <laughs> we love pigs, all of us, and we love helping people to uh, be able to be successful in their project. And then um, I think we're trying not to talk too loud because we're mic'd up, but if you can't hear us in the back, will you just let us know so we can speak up? I'll talk as loud as you want. We're good. I know, but it makes me really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't know we were going to be mic'd up. Um, <laughs> my, my name is Don Knopf, and um, I'm one of the swine leaders there. Um, I'm also a veterinarian in the area, and I see the majority of the show pigs um, in our county because there's not a lot of resources for that. So. Um, that's another kind of role that I take care of. I have four sons that compete in the swine project, and this is our eighth year doing it. And um, I actually had no intentions of doing the pig project until my friend Amy drug me along eight years ago, um, and I love it. It is, it is so much fun and good for the kids and um, just a real character-building experience. So I love it. My name is Amy Green, and I'm also a leader with Ramsey Rainer, Raiders. I actually lead goats, um, but do a lot with the pigs. This is our eighth year in pigs, and I showed pigs as a kid, but in Idaho County, it was much different than this. Um, we are very into the pigs. We're very into showing pigs, um, and everybody up here loves to help kids with questions and help you guys be really successful in your projects. And we weren't really sure how this was going to go or however many people are going to be there. So we have a general idea of what we'd like to present, but we'd really like it to be interactive because we don't really know what you wanted to get out of the session. So um, between the three of us, we have a lot of knowledge about um, the show pig project and pigs in general. So make sure if you have questions that at some point you get them asked so that we can make sure that everybody gets their, gets their questions asked. We also kind of represent a range of how we do things up here. So if these guys are talking about something and you're like, man, we don't have those kinds of facilities or we don't have you know, that, um, I might be a more moderate approach to the project. Um, we have dirt pens, we have 
you know, and so hopefully we can have a range of, of ideas up here sure. to help wherever, whatever your goal may be, whether it's just to have a successful project or to just do the very best you can and win the fair. Hopefully we'll find where you are in the middle of there and be able to help you where you're at. Yeah, that's for sure. That's what we want to help with is because um, we all do have different facilities and different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. the, I think the one thing that we all have in common is um, the fact that we, um, what's the word I'm trying to use, um, are consistent with what we do. So we're, we're, we want to teach that consistency here in this class also. So um, we're, we kind of made an outline because we didn't know what level of um, experience everybody had who was going to attend this. So we're going to start with setting goals. It's very important to set goals um, for the year because um, everybody has different goals. So um, one kid's goal might be to win quality at the fair and one kid's goal might be to be able to keep his pig from uh, staying on the fence in the show ring and somebody else might be showmanship so we we think it's very important to set those goals so you know um, so so your leader knows how to help you and so you you have a plan so that's the next thing is planning your year you really should um, plan your year do you have any input on um, so at this point um, you know, in the next month or so, the majority of people will be bringing their pigs home. And so if you have not secured um, an animal, you're gonna wanna look pretty hard to find one. Um, there's several local breeders in the area that can, that can help provide pigs. Ones like Linda that do it on a, on a list basis are full, but there are a few that still do auctions, so there are local pigs still available. Um, so just make sure that you work with either your breeder or your leader to make sure that you have animals lined up. Um, that would be the first step in planning. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, having, having a club, identifying an animal, making sure that you have the facility to bring them home, um, and then what your plan is moving forward. I would say that the one thing that, um, that I don't think is promoted enough is you should try to do one show other than the fair it during the summer that's so so important both for the animal and for your sh for the kids and your um, for exhibitors if you there's a, a very nice jackpot in Sandpoint um, that's the week after Father's Day and there's a very nice one in is it Colfax where's the police Palouse at uh, the Moscow Moscow, Moscow um, the first week of August so if you can make it a goal to do one show outside of the fair, I mean, it's what it's what my family enjoys, so we do one a month. Um, but even if that's not your game, you have other things going on and it's not your focus, one show during the summer will make your fair a thousand times easier. So um, maybe put that on your schedule for the year. And, and go ahead. Well, on, the, on that note, um, jackpots are a controversial thing in this, in different counties and um, some people are, are against jackpots I um, I look at it as it's kind of like kids that play sports they don't just play you know they don't just practice basketball all year long and then have one game at the end of the season they get to practice and play games throughout the year and that's kind of like what jackpots are it gives agricultural kids an opportunity to participate in shows other than just their fair. Um, there are pros and cons to jackpots. The biggest uh, con, I think, is exposing your pigs to other pigs, which can, you know, cause sicknesses. But we'll talk about that a little bit more down, you know, in an, down another subject about um, sicknesses. Can we go back to goal setting for just a second? Yes. Um, just to get an idea, who's Who's a first-year pig? This is your first pig ever in the room. So a couple of you, second year for people? A couple of you, third year? Okay. And more than three and years. more than three. So, so I just want to point out for you first-year kids, okay, that your goal setting should be something that's really attainable, okay? 
So winning the fair your first year, not saying it can't happen, but let's set a goal that is realistic, really attainable. Okay. Maybe it's learning how to show a pig, right? Or um, something simple. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the basics of growing a show pig and selling it at the sale, right? Um, and that's really what we're going to focus on today is um, how you're going to bring them home, how you're going to keep them healthy, and then how you're going to get them to fair the best way possible, clean, trained, and so you can have a great experience. I think my goal for this um, t tonight was I, I feel sad at the fair when kids are chasing their pigs up the aisle way. And, and can't control them, and, and in the show ring, they're not really knowing what they're doing, and it makes me feel bad for them, and I, I want to be able to help kids not have that happen. And um, we get lots of phone calls for people that would like to get into our club, and I feel bad that we have to limit to 20, but what we always tell people is we're happy to, tell, to teach the leader so the leader can go and teach their kids. So that's something we're always happy to do. Um, but that's my goal, is to help those kids that don't know how to show, don't know how to train their pig. I think it's all our goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one um, thing that'll set the 4-H program apart from others, is that mentorship aspect. So there's a lot of very experienced and very skilled showmen in our county that would love to help. So if you run into a wall or you're not sure how to proceed, reach out and see if somebody will come help. I, I have never told anybody no. Me when, neither. When they ask for help, um, I have four kids that are happy to come help. And I mean, it, it doesn't cost you anything. Like we consider it just a community pride. Um, now, we're not gonna go over there and train your pig. Like that's, <laughs> that's not the point, right? But if you need help, and you, want, and you want to try to do a good job, make sure that you use your resources. There's a lot of knowledge and experience in our county. Mm -hmm. Yes, and on that note, um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is know your, um, the rules, but I do wanna um, show you that we gave you guys two handouts, and I think um, it's very important as a parent, a leader, a kid, to know that it, also, t like we we don't have what we have just because we have been showing pigs for a while. It's because we've watched these videos, we've gone to these websites, we've um, just you know studied a lot of this stuff a lot. So we gave you guys these resources because there's really good educational websites where you can learn from. So it takes initiative on your part too by reach you know by looking these things up and we'll go over those a little bit more later so the second or third thing that will make your project successful is knowing the rules of the fair that you are going to or the jackpot so um, for example um, we'll just give a couple examples here. So, uh, for example, North Idaho State Fair, they have a minimum weight of 230 pounds. That means that your pig has to weigh 230 pounds to be able to sell in the auction or in the stock sale. Um, they cap the sale at 300 pounds, meaning if your pig weighs 305 pounds, you'll be paid for 300 pounds. Average daily gain is 1.25. That means that your pig has to gain at least 1.25 pounds a day to be able to compete in the finals. Am I correct on these? That's right. Okay. Um, so that is calculated from weigh-in to weigh-in. You should know how many days are in your feed period. Your feed period is from weigh-in to weigh-in so that you buy the correct size age hog and properly manage it to meet the requirements and be able to make your average daily gain without going over your ideal market weight. So you should always read the rules to the show or the fair that you're going to. That's really important to know those. So should we talk about that for a second? Sure. So. So how do we make sure that you make your minimum weight and your average daily gain, right? So you have to be able to find the ability to weigh your pig, right? Oh, there's, yeah. there's ways to do it without a scale. They're not as accurate, OK? 
Okay, so if you have somebody in your club that has a scale that will let you use it, whether you borrow it and take it home, or you can bring your pig to their house or to a central place for your club to weigh your pig, it's so, so, so important to weigh your pig often, especially the closer that fair is getting, so that you can absolutely make sure that you're making that 230 pounds. Because you can do a, a tape measurement, which is the length and the, and the width, and I don't remember how you do it. Um, we used that our first year. It's kind of accurate. I fully, I fully panicked when it said that the pig that we were trying to take was 120 pounds, so I bought a scale. Um, right. And uh, we've had the same scale for the whole eight years, and it still works fine. Um, the scales are, are expensive, so a lot of times clubs will just purchase one. I know Wild Westerners has done that, where their club owns one, and they you know lend it out to different people. But yeah, do find a way to weigh your pig. It'll it'll make you a lot more successful. Is it actually just a pig scale? Yeah, or a livestock, <laughs> it's a livestock or a, scale. Um, yeah. They call it <laughs> they call it a platform scale, oh, yeah. and there's lots of different variations of them. Um, the one that I purchased, like I said, it was at the beginning of our project, and I knew I had three other kids coming up, so I bought one that had the actual um, cage on it, mm -hmm. but. The, the platform ones work fine. You can put it up against a, yeah, a wall or a, mm -hmm. use a pallet, or there's lots of ways to get them on the scale. And we don't, we don't have the cage for ours, it's just the platform, mm -hmm. and we use marshmallows, oh. and they, <laughs> they get on there no problem. Yeah. We very rarely have mm -hmm. a pig, once they figure it out, they very, we very rarely have a, a pig that has a problem with it. Mm -hmm. um, there, is no, there is no real other way to be accurate than a scale. And you're, you're going to want to wait. Yeah, it's so important because a lot of times you'll, you know, like two weeks before the fair, somebody will call you up and say, I don't think my pig's going to make weight. And two weeks before the fair is not the time no. to do that. You know, that's why it's really important to know what it, what it weighs throughout the project. So even, you, if you, even if it was a once a month wait mm -hmm. until That'd July, really say, yeah. then you know what your gaining, your average daily gain is, right? You can, you can do the math and figure that out. Um, if you're on the low side, you're going to want to mate way more often and talk to somebody about how to feed that pig to get it up to weight, yeah. right? Um, when you get about a month from fair, we who have scales weigh every day pretty much. Um, so I, I would say that your goal 45 days ahead of, of fair should be about 200 pounds. So even if you don't have access to a scale and you can weigh six weeks ahead of, six or seven weeks ahead of fair, you know, there, that gives you enough time to make adjustments. Like she said, two weeks, there's nothing, like, there's nothing that we can do to help you at that point. If you're light at 45 days out, there's a lot of adjustments that you can make with feet at that point. Yeah. Um, and, and then we, we actually weigh weekly at our house, and one of the reasons good. for that, too, is because um, it's one of the first ways to tell your pig doesn't feel good is because they're they'll stop gaining Which means they're not eating well, so that's another reason that we wait often um, Sometimes the fairgrounds will open up their scale for you to weigh at the fairgrounds like on like maybe at sheep weigh-in or another way in they'll say hey the scales are open for you to come weigh so that um, That's another opportunity to be able to weigh your animal so what we're going to do after each one of these subjects is kind of open it up for questions before we move on to the next subject. So do you guys have questions regarding what we just talked about? Nobody? Okay. Do you have any more to say on, so. on that? <clears throat> um, now we're going to talk about buying your project pig. Um, it's really good to develop a relationship with a breeder. Um, I, I got a, I raise pigs and we have other breeders in the area that raise pigs and I got, I get, this time of year I get a lot of people calling me and it's way too late to be getting a pig from me at that point. Um, I got an email today from a lady in Montana that I was like, oh great, another one that I have to say no to. but. Luckily, she said for 2025, and I was like, now that's what I like to see, you know, <laughs> planning ahead. You on my list. So, <laughs> yeah, so put, you know, think about that. Like when you're at the fair um, or when you have 
you know, just find out who the breeders are that you're interested in and talk to them, tell them you'd really like to show one of their pigs, what, was it, what would it take to buy one, how do you do your sale. So just develop a relationship with a breeder is... I have one question. I mean, who does not have a pig secured for this year? Like, does everybody have a plan? So you've talked to your leader, your breeder, whatever, you know where you're getting your animals. That's great, because that's a huge, yeah, for that's sure. a huge hurdle. So, Very good. Um, and then along those lines, um, depending on where you're getting them from, you, you need to make sure that you're not mixing pigs from different sources. Yeah, that was my next uh, on this list, is if you have no other, no other way to do it, then of course you'll mix them, but that's not ideal. Mixing pigs from different sources is kind of a recipe for a disaster because it's there's like different. sending your kid to kindergarten for the first time. So mm -hmm. they just trade bugs. So the, per, the a pig will seem perfectly healthy and it's just getting over a virus and it'll give it to the other animal. So you really want to keep them separate for a couple weeks if, if possible. Or like I said, ideally just get them from the same source. Um, and, and they, they the might have thing, different immunization yeah. statuses. You know, like one farm might Im immunize for certain things and another one doesn't. So um, it's just important to... Um, and if, it's, if you're planning on getting it from one of the truckloads that they haul in with multiple pigs, there's nothing wrong with that. But understand that those are young animals that have been hauled a long distance and they're very often gonna be sick. So watch them very carefully when you first get them home um, and make sure that they're tolerating being transported like that. So I guess on that note, um, we gave you guys some uh, resources of educational um, websites. At the very um, bottom is True North Technologies and um, for, uh, Stony Creek Veterinary Service. So both of the, I, I use Stony Creek personally for my, um, I use their protocol for vaccinations, but True North has on their blog um, vaccinations that they should use, and he personally recommends, Dr. Farnham personally recommends that you vaccinate your pig regardless. regardless. Like when it comes to your house, you vaccinate it. I don't necessarily believe that that's um, real important unless you really don't know. If you do not know what it's been vaccinated for, if they can't tell you, if they just, if the breeder just says, oh yeah, I vaccinated, but they don't tell you what they vaccinated for, then yeah, I would do it. Especially if you're going to be doing jackpots or exposing your pigs to other pigs or bringing those pigs in from uh, long distances. So, um, so on that blog of Dr. Farnham's, and it's very similar to uh, Stony Creek's, is um, if you, it's the last two on there, um, it's, he has the vaccination protocol that he recommends uh, to do when you bring them home. That True, True North Technology blog is actually really good. It has a lot of um, helpful, specific information about common problems in show pigs. So there's a whole article on ulcers in show pigs, which is very common. There's a whole ar article on bringing them home and you know vaccination. So um, that's, that's definitely a very useful uh, website that True North I think it's truenorthfeed.com maybe. It used to be Go and Show which was a way easier to remember, but um, I think it's True North Feed now. I, I put down True North Technologies because that's what I, yeah. And you just, and yeah. if you Google that, it'll, it'll, it'll pop up. up and then go to their blog. And then same with uh, Stony Creek Veterinary Service or four, they call themselves Four Star also, is they have, you have to search for them a little bit on their Facebook page, but they also have very good, um, yeah. Uh, videos and talk they call it talk to the doc and they have lots of good information on same type of subjects okay so yeah so the last thing on that was to know what they've been vaccinated for and limit their exposure to other pigs until you can vaccinate them and instead of buying like a whole bottle of the, you know, like your club could buy a, a bottle of the medicine and everybody 
vaccinate or um, Four Star Veterinary Clinic will, or I'm sorry, the very last one, Stony Creek Veterinary Clinic, they, it's kind of interchangeable, that name, they use both of them. But they, if you call them and talk to them, they can send you just like individual, individual doses. But it would be good like if you got together as a club and bought the bottles also. Okay, any questions on, on that? Nope, okay. So we'll move on to um, bringing baby pigs home. Um, your facility should be prepared ahead of time. They should be clean. If you've had pigs there before, it's good to disinfect. Um, there should be sufficient bedding, um, heat lamps, shelter from the elements, um, a feeder and water. So shelter from the elements is the most important thing. You wanna keep them out of the wind and from getting wet. Um, and you gotta keep in mind they come from, you know, warmth at home. You know, they're coming out of a heated barn usually. So it's important to keep them warm, like to throw a whole bale of straw in there that they can just get underneath and bury themselves in it. I like to, if I had an outside pin, what I would personally do is do a bale of shavings first to kind of insulate the ground and then like a bale of straw. But it's very, very important to have lots of bedding because the nights are still cold for a while. Yeah, and that's, this is one area where we're very different in our facilities at this point. And so that's All three why, of us. Yeah, we thought that we would um, kind of give some examples of, of what to try. So. Um, we, we started with a shared dirt pen with a shelter and um, didn't have too much trouble with that other than in the spring it's really, really rainy. So the pigs would be fine in the house, but when they would go out to eat, they're just standing out in the rain. Um, so we put up some sort of covering so that they could get out of the rain. It's still not as ideal as keeping them under cover at, at the same time. Um, now we do have our pigs inside because my husband got tired of me whining about it. <laughs> but um, so when we bring pigs home, it's not as big of a deal anymore for the weather part of it. But Amy's had to make some adjustments to how they've received baby pigs. And I think our, pro our situation is probably the most common. We don't have a barn. Our pigs are not inside. And so um, we have a three-sided shelter that we started with. It's uh, six by 12, it's a dirt floor. And I, we do bed it with shavings first, and then we'll put an entire bale of, yep. So we started there, and then we realized there's too much wind getting in there, so we blocked it with straw bales. That was nice, right? Um, same thing happened where the pigs are warm inside the shelter. They come out to eat, and they're doing some hot and cold and hot and cold, and it's kind of rainy and wet. And we pretty consistently, about a couple weeks into getting pigs home, would end up with colds and flus and things that we'd have to treat them for. So we have, in the last couple of years, brought pigs home, tarped our horse trailer, and kept them in there. So they're consistently warm, they have enough room to move around, um, and we've had far less illness from bringing the baby pigs home by keeping them in that horse trailer for the first couple of weeks. I have a question on the yeah. horse because that's what we're we're building a pen sure. with the shelter but then like my thought is for the first few weeks putting them in the horse yeah trailer. yeah but one one person made a comment about them chewing and there's like oh. wood on the side so do you guys have that issue so i don't have that issue with the little pigs okay um and if you're worried about it, um, we've, with the older pigs, put a panel down, the four by four squares, and then covered that with uh, shavings so they can't like chew your mats and stuff. Mm -hmm. The little ones, I don't have a problem with chewing things. We keep them in our horse trailer. I brought pictures, I was gonna try to put them on the, up there. If you're interested in looking at our setup, I'm happy to show you. Um, the horse trailer is just so much more contained and there's that, no wind. The wind and, is the biggest yeah, thing. Yeah, it is. And in, like, you know, if I go back to where we had them in that three-sided shelter, we did have a heat lamp out there for a while. They will eat your heat lamp. Mm -hmm. Glass and all. Mm -hmm. You will not find a shard of glass. The pigs will eat it. So don't put it where they can so reach it. So <laughs> don't put it where they can reach it. We didn't have a choice that it's, you know, it's only a three-foot shelter in the back. It's four in the front, I think. Um, 
And really, if you bed them deep with straw, you don't need a heat lamp, actually. They get down in the straw so far, you'll think you lost your pigs. And you have to dig in there to find them, and they'll just be snoring and super warm. But that's where putting the shavings down first to kind yeah. of insulate the ground, and, and then. I, yeah. And I'm a weenie, I would never not use a heat lamp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I would be stressed all night. Yeah. But, but I have seen, I, I would much rather see somebody do, some, yeah. do something like the horse trailer, yeah. stock trailer. Um, I've seen people uh, tie four pallets together in their garage with a heat lamp. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's, it's so much better than, than getting sick pigs because they can die so fast and they're not cheap. And, and yeah, within days, if they get, if they get sick when they're um, 50 pounds, they're, they're, I mean, sometimes we can't save them even if we treat them right away. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, there's nothing wrong with tying four pallets together in your garage or putting them in a horse trailer or whatever it takes to keep them warm. But yeah, the biggest thing is keeping them out of the wind. And, and then wet. next, if you can, just keep them out of the elements, even if we were to contain them in that little shelter for a couple of weeks until they're big enough or the weather's good enough um, that it's not such a fluctuation. Um, you'll, you'll find that you get have less problems for sure, the more contained they are. Yes. <clears throat> And I wouldn't say that our horse trailer is warm by any stretch of the imagination. No we, it's no wind, and we have one place that's that straw where they can get burrowed in there and stay nice and cozy and warm, and then the rest of it is where they run and play and eat and have water and things. Um, but the contain, there, there's a little four by four space, I would say, that they can like burrow into the straw and stuff. Yeah, they don't need a lot of exercise at that point. They just no. need to stay warm and mm -hmm. out of the wet. Mostly, I like that they can get out so they're not pooping in their bed. Yeah, if you give them if enough they room, can get they, away they'll from definitely their bed stay so away from there poop. where they sleep. Okay, so um, it's very, very important that you check those pigs no less than two times a day. Um, when you bring them home, you should be checking for a change in their stool, any coughing, or runny nose. Or if they're just laying under their heat lamp. Yep, and they're not come, getting up to come eat or um, moving around if they're just staying under the heat lamp or if they're breathing hard. Any change in their um, normal behavior, it's very important to treat immediately, not be like, oh, I'll do it in the morning. You know, we get phone calls at 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, but I mean, not that we like those phone calls, but, um, but you know, it, it would be nice if you checked it, like let's say five, at six, five or six at night, and if you notice a difference, call immediately, um, because it, overnight could be too late. When you call, you should know what the symptoms are, and you should be able to explain those to whoever you're calling, the breeder, the vet, your leader. your leader, you should be able to say, it's just not getting up from the heat lamp, it's just laying there and it kind of sounds like it's breathing hard, or you should know its temperature. That's one of the first things is take its temperature and let us know, you know, what, what's its temp. Does it have a runny nose? Is it coughing? Now I will tell you that um, what I have noticed this year with my sows and with the baby pigs is that um, the straw kind of, I don't know, the little pieces get caught in their throat. So I'm like listening like, is that really a cough or did they just eat straw? And a lot of, and a lot of times, it, like remember Molly this summer? Mm -hmm. I really thought this pig was uh, dying. dying if you heard this cough that it was, I mean I was, uh, my barn is quite a distance from the house and I was watching TV and I heard this cough and I, I was like, what is that? And I, could, I mean, it just, sound, it didn't even sound like a cough and um, thought the pig was dying and it really was just straw caught in her throat. So anyway, so you, you know, like, you kind of know the difference. Like my baby pigs just got transitioned from pelleted food to powdered food, and same thing. They're coughing a little bit, but you got to kind of know the difference. 
The, you'll know if you're just if you if you watch your pig and know your pig, you'll know the difference. However, if you were standing with any of the three of us when one of those pigs caught, it, it catches our attention immediately. Yeah, we all go. Stop it! Who right did that? Now. Who did that? Right Which one's now. doing that? Yeah. So, so it is important to um, act on it immediately. Don't wait. Call for help. Explain your symptoms and know the temperature. Does anybody have questions on that? You guys don't have questions? <laughs> Yay. What are you treating them with if they have a cold? So it depends a little bit, like um, most of the time you're gonna give them some sort of an antibiotic because they're very, very prone to pneumonia. That's what they'll die from. Um, and then if they have a fever, we give them um, usually banamine, which is a fever reducer. So it'd be like giving your child Tylenol or Advil when they have a fever. Um, the difference is pigs will get like 106, 107 degree fevers. So when they when they spike a temperature, it, it gets pretty exciting. So it's important to get it down. Um, you know, sometimes if your kid has a low grade fever, we just kind of leave them alone and let it run its course. That's not usually the case with a the pig. They they won't get up from their their they won't eat, they won't drink, they stay under their heat lamp. Like, and as soon as you break the fever. They'll get up and they'll eat, and then the and then they're going to heal faster if you if you get them back up and and feeling better. Um, so yeah, I I tend to treat earlier because I've I've just had enough of them die um, mm -hmm. that it's not worth it to me to wait because if you wait too long then you can't you can't treat them. So I'd rather treat them early and maybe they didn't need it <laughs> than mm -hmm. wait and then have them die. Okay. So I have a couple questions. One find something. How do you take the temperature? Do you use one of those? Um, <laughs> oh, it's a uh, rectal. 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 Yeah. 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 rectal. I was afraid of that. Yeah, yeah. and just yeah. take whatever thermometer you're going to use and make a big X on it. it yeah. The digital, it those digital box. ones, and the $5 the digital ones work okay. fine. If they're not feeling well, mm -hmm. they'll pretty much let you do it. If you and have if to you chase walk, them around, yeah. they're not that sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time. Um, yeah. Most of the time. Second is, do you just keep some of these things, like for the fever and the, um, you know, these medicines on hand, obviously? Yeah, so that's not something that you'll have on hand. Those those are prescription medications. Um, there are some breeders that have it because they have that number of pigs. Um, otherwise, if they're that sick, people will either contact me or contact the group out of Sandpoint will see pigs. I think Doc Holly has a large animal vet. So there are a few. That's another thing to find out is, you know, what, what veterinarian you plan on using if you need them, and hopefully you don't. Right. But at least having an idea of who to call if you end up in that situation yeah. is important. Yeah, I think it's really important to develop a relationship with the vet also. Sure. Say, hey, my kid's taken a swine project this year. You know, we've been told that they can, you know, is this something you have on hand if they get sick? How do I go about, you know, getting this from you if I need it? you know that type of stuff it's very important to develop a relationship yeah, that, with a vet that's just been in the last year there were some antibiotics that were available at tractor supplier in north 40 but that's not the case anymore the the laws have changed on that so you can't purchase those i want to make a quick note oh, just say i want to make a quick note that um coughing is not the only serious symptom if your pig's head tilts oh yeah that is a lights and sirens moment. That is, I don't care what time of day it is, you get hold of a vet and you get medicine immediately. And Don can explain that further, but that is a absolute, you call somebody right now. Yeah, there's, there's a few reasons that you wouldn't wanna wait. So the cough is the most common one because they're very prone to respiratory disease. Um, so that's the most common one that you see. Um, things that could wait a day or two or even longer than that would be like a rash. You know, some of these pigs will get skin mites or other sensitivities. That's not an emergency. Um, the head tilt um, could be that you sprayed water in their ear and it also could be a middle ear infection and, and that can cause a permanent um, change in that animal. So if they, if they act drunk or they act unsteady on their feet, um, that could also be uh, meningitis in a pig, so this, this, they can get meningitis, they can get inner ear infections. Um, so again, back to the checking on them a couple of times a day, like if you notice something that's off. If it gets up and is walking towards you like this, 
yeah. or it gets like up and it falls over or it gets up and it's walking in circles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so on that note, she mentioned a water in the ear. Um, that's very important not to get water in the ear. So if you're like pouring water into something and the pig's running over there to drink it, you know, it, be careful not to get water in its ear. When you're at the fair and you're washing your pig with those hoses, we've seen kids just waterboard their pigs and it's sad. And, you know, the pig's walking in the show ring like this and that's typically from getting water in the ear. Um, one year, um, right after weigh-in, and I attributed it to um, the tag, but I can't be sure, um, one of my grandson's pigs um, got up and walked with his head tilted and then he was falling over and turning circles and and we treated him immediately but he was never he the never same recovered. he never recovered and that's why I say lights and sirens because I hear those stories and it's devastating when your kids pig is not showable, not and, showable. and this yeah. pig was kept in a barn it was kept <clears throat> warm and dry. Yeah, sometimes it's just random. It's not anything yeah. that you could have prevented. No. It wasn't water. And you we've know. and we have treated them early enough. <coughs> Excuse me, where it's been completely corrected. So that doesn't have to always be the case. Yeah. Um, one of the things I personally recommend and I'm not sure it helps or not, but if your pigs get ear tagged at the fair um, I think it's good to um, use um, chlorohexidine on their ear, wash it on the front and the back with chlorohexidine to just make sure that if there is bacteria um, that it... Or it, just any sort of sanitizing wipe, I mean, yeah. you could use pretty much anything. Because I, I can't prove that it happened at, at um, weigh-in, but it's very coincidental that it happened the day after weigh-in and that pretty much ruined his project year that year. Um, he had an alternate pig, but that wasn't his favorite. So um, be just be aware mm -hmm. of that. That's a good note too, is have an alternate if you can, if you have the facilities. They eat better with an extra buddy. And just in case something goes wrong with your project, if you can have two, you should have two. Or at least one family alternate. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. our fair, North Idaho State Fair, allows you to have one extra pig per family. So if you have siblings, you can share that alternate. Is there any questions on that subject that we just talked about? I was going to say, hopefully get to know um, the vet also if you want to do jackpots and are going out of the state. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're doing a jackpot out of the state, um, they have to have a health certificate, health certificate. To, cross so, to cross state lines. And now this year, they're also required, if they're going into the state of Washington, they're required to have the um, 840, tag. 840 tag in their ear. So if you're planning on going to a jackpot in Washington or a fair, like Spokane Interstate Fair, like all my grandkids take their alternate pig to Spokane Air State Fair, by the way. It's a very fun fair, so consider doing that. Um, we love it. Um, so um, that's something that you can get, you know, from your breeder or a vet or um, I guess Junior Show is sending them out to the kids? Just A40 tape. Just say 40 tape if you're going to Junior Livestock Show. Okay, that's a good point, Jody. <laughs> So we have, um, I guess the next sections are more specific to the project, but like, is there anything that you were hoping to learn that we haven't haven't even touched on? Like, do you want to hear more about training or showmanship or feeding or like, is there something you were hoping to learn today? Nobody? What? I kind of want to learn more about how to train. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we're, the, the next subject was talking about when you brought the pig home day one. Um, day one is very important. Um, you bring it home um, and p different people will have different opinions of what you should do. But the least that you should do is sit in there with that pig and talk to it, let it get to know your voice. Like you'd be surprised at how 
they like they my pigs at my house my baby pigs they know my voice like mm -hmm. Amy was at the house today and she we went into one of the barns and and all those pigs took off running because they didn't recognize her so getting in there sitting with your pig reaching out and trying to scratch it brush it with a soft brush just sitting there letting it come up and chew on your boots mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're very smart and very social. So yes. The so the last thing you want to do is scare them. Yeah. Because if you scare them, it's going to take a long time to earn their trust. So yes. So them. you're not going to expect too much the first day. You're just your hope is that they're just getting to know you. So they're going to come up and and chew on your boots. And if you reach out and they take off running, just uh, kind of reach out slow like this and kind of scratch their belly. Um, just getting to let the pig get to know you and you get to know the pig. So that's a really important first step of training the pig. And that's is, easiest to do in a smaller area. So um, like even mm -hmm. the horse trailer or wherever you're going to contain them while they're little. Yeah. Um, so no fast movements, like some pigs, they're not afraid of you at all, and there's no problem. But other ones, you have to kind of just reach out like this and scratch its belly, and pretty soon it's going to realize that feels good, and then it'll come right up to you and crawl in your lap practically. But that's one of the most important things is doing that for the first from the first day on. And the other thing that um, I've learned over the years is the pigs respond to the individual kids, so. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do me any good to go gentle the pig down because it'll still be wild for the kid. So make sure that it's the kid who's going to be showing that animal that's in there gentling them down and feeding them and brushing them and training them because everybody does things a little bit differently and they get used to it. Mm -hmm. So um, even the youngest child, I mean, my youngest son, first of all, he's the youngest of four, so he's fairly neglected. <laughs> but he's he's been shown and training his own pig since he was probably four years old because you just don't give him another option and yeah. they figure it out Linda's granddaughter she, I mean she was probably three yeah when she trained her first pig so but, it, but, it can be done yeah. but the but you gotta down first. Yeah. the funniest story about about that is have you ever seen where the judges have the kids trade their pigs trade pigs to see if they can show somebody else's pig. Well, my granddaughter had a pretty big pig and she could never reach, you know, where you're supposed to hit it. She would just reach over and hit it on the shoulder and it responded to her. You know, she could take it everywhere and stuff, but she um, she did have to trade pigs at the open show at of uh, Coeur d'Alene last year and I kind of was laughing because the kid was trying to get the pig to move, but it was so used to her hitting it mm -hmm. on the shoulder that yeah, that's what it that's yeah. what it responded to. But yeah, she's been showing since she was three well probably the first time she was in the show ring was at two but all she was doing is following the pig around and whacking it on the back but she got she got serious last year <laughs> serious <laughs> so so super important to gentle them down first um, and then as soon as they're gentled down and what I mean by that is you can you can walk in and brush them or pet them or and they're not afraid of you um, that's that's usually takes a week or at most two weeks, mm -hmm. that's when my kids start doing some basic whip training with them. Um, it doesn't mean that they have them out ready to be shown, but start moving them around so that they start to understand what the point is of whatever utensil you use. Um, most, most common now is a, is a whip of some sort, so you get them used to what that feels like and what it means. Um, like I said, the gently. The, the gently, the biggest thing is, is to not make them afraid of you. So, yeah. um, so this what? sounds ridiculous, but I also have all boys. There's different types of whips. Some mm -hmm. of them hurt a lot worse than others. So um, I take whatever whip they're going to use and on their bare legs, I give them a couple little taps. I mean, you don't have to be very firm with them for them to get an idea of what it feels like. The kid. So the kid. The yeah. kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they know what that feels so they like. Know what they feels like, and and there's whips that are better um, tasseled or softer whips for those babies that don't know what's ha what's going on. And then as they get older, you know, you need a little bit um, more severe whip, but that more severe whip takes far less pressure. So. My kids call those stingers because when you use it on their leg, 
But, uh, but, <laughs> but on that note, you know you're hitting it too hard if the pig jerks, you know, like yeah. you, you tap it here and it jerks. That's too hard. You know, you're, you're just wanting it to, to move. You're not Especially wanting as babies. To, yeah. So what we do at our house, and I think we'll talk about that, what each person does at their house because it's different. Kind of like what I said in the beginning. We're consistent with what we do, but we all do it differently. So what my grandkids do is they just start uh, getting it out of its pen and walking it. Like if if this was this is a pretty big barn, but let's just say um, that this is your barn and this is the pen right here. It, they'll be like, okay, I'm going to walk. They have a goal. I'm going to walk it over there and then back to its pen. And then the pig might not even be listening to you, it might be just running all over, but you can go over to it and guide it like, I don't want you over here, I want you over here. So you're just telling it, I don't want you here, I want you to move over here. And that's how we start, it's just moving them around different areas of the barn. Um, I have one granddaughter and um, four grandsons and Amy thinks that the goal is to the, the first one to get it on the scale. So she, that's her goal. I'm going to get my pig on the scale before my cousin, that's on my brothers, and and so that's what she tries doing. Is you know, and the smaller kids seem to really be able to, they they do pretty good because they can get down low and they can see right when that pig starts to go somewhere else and they can just stop it real quick. So um, just moving it from one location to another. That's what we f we do at our house. Um, yeah, and like I said, my, my kids have a little bit more experience at this point, but once those pigs are gentled down, it's the same thing, they'll um, kind of select a goal. Usually theirs is time, not distance, and they'll take them for a loop. We don't have them contained anymore. When we very first started, um, it helps to have an area where they can't run away from you because they're pretty fast and you have to go try to catch them. So now they just have um, just an open open field and open yard that they walk them in. But like I said, they're, they're far more experienced at this point. So they know how to control those animals. So it's a little different than when it's your very first year. So your very first year, just teaching them how to turn and how to go forward is really the basics. Yeah. So, um, so the go button on the yeah. pig is right in the flank here. So you don't hit them on their back. You don't hit them on the back of their legs. Um, it's right right here where the leg meets with the belly, and we call the turn signals are on the face. So you, you give them pressure until they move, <coughs> the face, you, then you let up. And they figure it out pretty, pretty fast mm -hmm. as long as you're consistent. And where you stand on the pig is very important too. You should be standing right at the flank. If you have a pig that is backing up, look where you are. You're usually on its shoulder. So if your pig is like backing up and not wanting to move forward, look at where your position is on the pig and it's usually because you're too far forward and you need to back up to the flank. Yeah, so I wanted to also mention when you're taming your pigs down, a good time to do it is when you feed them. So if they're, if they're not really interested yet in coming and chewing on your boots or being close to you, uh, my boys will put the feed in their feeder and then sit there and annoy them when they're eating and they'll scratch their backs and they'll kind of run away and then they come back to the feed. So they just get used to being touched. Oh, you want to eat? You have to be touched, you know? And pretty soon they're doing this, but they're eating and they're like <laughs> scooting away and they just mess with them until they're like, it doesn't bother me and they, and they don't mind anymore. Um, and pigs so love to have their bellies scratched. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, 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 and it took, and it took a couple years before my kids figured out that you can have, you can get a pig to lay down by scratching yeah. its oh, yeah. Like so some, some of them, you can just they're, touch they're them like, and they go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll lay on yeah. your feet. They yeah. just expect it. Yeah. They yeah. love to have it. So, so as you can see, we all do things differently. Yeah. But it's basically the same. And we have arranged when we get ours out of the trailer just amongst the three of us. And why I say three of us is we get three pigs, one for each boy and then we have an alternate. And I typically walk the alternate when the boys are walking their pigs. Yeah. Um, we nothing, like to walk them to get, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is my time that I spend with my kids each day. We, we all do it together. We call it Team Green. We all help each other out. So yeah. I help them walk the alternate. One of them will train it. I am merely a walker. And yeah. by the end of the summer, I cannot show any of our pigs because they don't like me. 
I can walk it from here to there, but I can't actually show it because yeah. they, they wonder what the heck I'm doing because yeah. everything's different. When I start, I like the tasseled ones. Because mm -hmm, they're softer. Um, they're yeah. soft, and really, you just wag it in their eyes, and it kind of, you know, they'll turn away from it. So you don't need to go, like, smacking on it. The, the worst thing you can do on a little pig is start whacking it. Okay, they get scared. This is not something that they pig, like to on do. Any pig, no and what big. your goal is is that when they're excited to go walk, they're excited to get out and go for their walk. And so we set small goals, like maybe it's one time around the horse trailer, and really it's about getting them out and and stopping and scratching them, and telling them this is fun. We like to be out. We like to do these things. Going another ten feet. We, this is fun. We like to do this and. And you do that until you're, you know, a half a mile from the house eventually. Because yeah, they'll be afraid the first time you take them out. Yeah, they will. And some are, some aren't. Some yeah. are, yeah. Some right. don't like whatever that is underneath their feet. Like if you have them on concrete in a barn, some of them don't like the feel of yeah. the grass or the dirt. Or gravel. So, uh, or gravel. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that we want to walk them on gravel, but... Um, but, yeah, it's getting them out, you know, and we can talk about different problems that you know like when you were talking about my grandson had a pig one time that didn't want to leave the barn there's nothing we could do to get it to leave the barn so what he did is he fed it right on the concrete in front of the barn and then the next day he moved it 10 feet and moved it you know until he was quite a distance away from the house because he did not want to leave the barn so there's just different tricks to to do but on that hitting um, this is further down the road of training. Um, if you ever do have a pig that is is stubborn or afraid or just doesn't want to move forward, it, it never works to hit that pig hard. It never works to beat on it. Um, we've had different experiences over the years of, of stubborn pigs or my one grandson had one for the last two years that so was stubborn, which I kind of figured out why. But um, the biggest thing we did is when it wanted to turn around and run back home, we just kind of redirected its brain. So what we did is stop and like when it was starting to be like, oh, I'm going to turn around and go back, we just scratched it and made it like, oh, you know, it's like she said, fun to be out here, this feels good. And then it stopped thinking about, I'm going to turn around and run back to the barn. And then you ask it to go 10 more feet and then you stop and scratch it and make it feel good. It never works to beat the pig, never works. And they're, they will make you that frustrated. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You want to beat them. It doesn't, but it, it doesn't do it doesn't any good. Work. Yeah. And that's the other thing. So if you're a first year member, I don't know what everybody's clubs are set up like, but um, if you've got the pig gentle down and you're ready to start training and you, and you really don't know how to do it, um, there's, oh, some, there's some good videos yeah. on here. On here we put um, some videos. There's a really, the second one down is, is very good. Um, it's Chad Booth. He's a local uh, resident and he has a Facebook video. I put the picture by there just in case you could, couldn't find the link. You can see the picture and be like, oh, okay, that's the one. Um, there's uh, Sh Showrite has lots of really good videos. Um, there's, so Showrite Stock Show, all you have to do is put your name and your email address in there and then you can watch their videos. Um, so I think that's the also a good time to ask for help. Yeah. So if you're just very first starting and you really just don't have any idea and you've watched some videos and you've talked to your leader, um, that's when maybe reach out to an older member that has either in your own club or like I said, you know, our, our kids have all helped plenty of times. But this um, second video is really good for yeah. beginners. So, um, so then we're gonna, once we kind of gentled the pig down and we start taking it for walks, once again, we're, we all do things differently. So um, my grandkids have a trail through the woods. You know, they have to go by the house first and, um, and then there's a, they can, there's a Y that they can split off and go over here or they can go that way. And so we actually do that. Like some of them will go this way and some of them will go this way so that they're not um, used to always being with a partner, you know, they, the pig. So the pig gets used to being away from the partner. So it will be like, okay, you go right, you go left. 
one of the things that I finally picked up on last year, it took two years, but one of my grandsons would walk his pig, and then when he got back, I would ask him to do something, and the pig would throw a fit, and I thought, that is so weird. He just walked it for a half hour. Why, why is it not behaving now? Well, the pig got used to just going for the walk. He wasn't asking it to do something. It just walked, and he was tapping it on the side and following it, but now what he does is he'll go head, you know, down the trail, and he'll be like, okay, I'm gonna go right around the fire pit, you know, so he takes it around the fire pit, and then he's gonna go left around the apple tree, and then he's gonna, you know, he's asking it to do something. So don't just walk it and follow it, ask it to zigzag, you know, like uh, we helped a kid in Post Falls last year and he was just walking it around the pasture and it's like, no, zigzag across the pasture. And, and you can set up obstacle courses with cones, we've done a lot of that. Um, the other thing is, is that when you're walking your pig, that's not the time that they get to explore their world. Mm -hmm. So if you, you don't want to let them, you know, root and dig and explore, um, really when you're walking them, that's kind of work time. So the, the more they get used to the fact that it's time to walk and not explore, um, you'll have a lot less problems for with sure. them looking for stuff. For sure. You know, sticks to carry or, I mean, like, they'll do all sorts of crazy things. But. Um, they'll also get habituated, so if you can go different places, oh, yeah. change it up as much as possible. For one, it gets them used to trusting you and going where you ask them to. Um, and two, they don't just, you know, they'll, they're smart and some of them are real ornery. So they'll take their trip as fast as they can go and then they'll run back to their pen. And we've had pigs that do that. As soon as we hit the pasture and they can see their pen, they want to run. And what the boys do is it's always on your terms. It is never on the pig's term, terms. So if they automatically say we're turning left, then the boys will go another 10 feet until it's their Idea. on their terms of turning the pig, right? It's never on the pig's terms. So if they're running back to the pen, then they, they do circles and they get closer each circle until they get to the pen. So it's on their terms, not the pigs. Yes. So you have to figure out some tricks, but you don't ever want that pig making the decisions for you. And on that note, that same grandson that I was telling you about whose pig was very stubborn for the last two years, um, once we figured it out, it was the end of May, once we figured out what the problem was. So it took me and my daughter um, to go for a walk with Andy, and the minute that pig decided to turn around, we did everything in our power to block it so it did not get to turn around. And so, you know, and it was hard. It was hot and we were sweating and it was fighting us. But what we did is we blocked it, but then we scratched it to redirect its brain so it wasn't panicking, like I gotta get home. So we, you know, scratched it, like it's okay, it's okay, then asked it to go 10 more feet. Then scratched it, asked it to go 10 more feet. But once they learn a bad habit, it takes, I guess that's another thing I wanted to say when you say you walk the alternate pig. Mm -hmm. It's a family project. I mean, it is the kids, we're not gonna be feeding it and all that stuff, but the more you are out there with your kid helping them and, and um, watching them and encouraging them, the more successful they're gonna be. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you shouldn't be out there with them because it's they'll be more Absolutely. successful if one, you are participating yeah, with one them. One caution, um, your goal is gonna be a 20 to 30 minute walk. You can't start with that. No. So um, you have to start with very short time periods to where you're not over um, stimulating or tiring out your pig because you like like everybody's saying you want them to like their walk and if they're very very tired and fatigued they're, they're just going to fight you the entire time so start with small short walks and increase the time as they tolerate it so depending on the animals like sometimes we'll walk until um, they pant and then take them back to the pen and that might just be a few minutes um, that's not necessarily a <laughs> the goal to get them to pant. But if they pant, we cool them off and take them back to the pen. And we always cool ours off when they come home. We have a wash rack and we always take them to the wash rack. But it's very important if you have a hot pig that you all of a sudden don't just squirt it all over its body with the, a hose. You start at the feet and move up because they, what, what happens? 
Yeah, I mean, you can just put them into shock, but the biggest thing that we do is we just don't walk them in the hottest part of the day. Yeah. So um, a now. couple of years ago when it was 110 degrees and my kids were up at 5 a.m. walking pigs because you got it done before it got too hot. Mm -hmm. so now we do things a little differently at our house. <laughs> so we don't always walk our pigs in the heat of the day, but we do walk our pigs in the heat of the day. And the reason is it's hot at the fair. It's hot at the fair, and they have to get used to walking in that heat. Now, we're not going to overheat them, but we do walk our pigs in the heat of the day. And my kids like to walk them in the evenings when it's cooling down. So in the summertime, you know, 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock, they walk them for yeah. half an hour. Yeah. Um, consistency is key. So same time of day, you know, They'll even get habituated where they don't poop in their pen. They're waiting for you to come and take their walk, and then they'll poop somewhere else. So if you do it the same time every day, Not at all. Um, <laughs> they'll do you a favor, and you won't have to clean your pen near so much. So um, try to do oh, the same thing all the time. Landed. Try to do it every day. You will really benefit from spending that time with your pig every single day. And this. to do a really, really good job with your project, it's less than an hour a day yep. time commitment. For sure. Even split into two, you know, 30 yeah. minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, you can do a very, very good job. And so with your question about showmanship, um, training. training your pig, this is the video that you're going to want to watch right here. And it'll show you where the go button is, how to turn it, it'll show you all up. All is of this that. your first year? No, he no. says he's had it for a few oh. years. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, um, yeah, if you're talking more about, like, head training and stuff, um, the biggest thing to start with is to not let them put their head down when you're walking them. Start with that. Yeah. And then, then once they have the hang of that, um, then there's some other techniques. And I think there's some of those videos will um, go over it, but using using two whips on either side where it's just under their chin so they can't put their head down um, and you're not really touching them it's just a reminder that they shouldn't put their head down mm -hmm. and then then you transition that to one whip later but that would be another opportunity to ask for an older member to come and show you so that you can watch it and and practice it um, but because it's a little bit hard to describe it's a little easier yeah. to show yeah. but the biggest thing is to start right away they always put their yeah. head down. Yeah. It doesn't matter that it's not up. Yeah. But they right. do not get to go dig in the dirt and, yeah. and, and some of that while they're on a walk. And I've moving. always yeah, I, I've always said this and I truly believe it. You could, and I'm not recommending this, but you could train your pig the first month you bring it home and then put it away for a couple months versus don't train it at all and then train it a month before the fair. It remembers what you trained that oh, first month. Right if you just didn't do anything to it until July, you it, you might as well it's not late. even. It's yeah. too late. Especially but on if the head you, training. Yeah, but if you work with it um, that first month, and then you know, let's you know, because there's families that um, p kids have to go back and forth between parents, and they might not be able to walk their pig every day in the summer or things like that. So you're much better off training that pig that first right when you bring it, not the day you bring it home, but after this process that we've talked about, taming it and stuff, is training it that first month. I mean, like all our kids walk their pigs every day, but if that, if your household cannot do that, then... And, and although last year our alternate was kept at a different facility, and so we just went twice a week to do training, um, and that's, that still was enough. So yeah. It's not, that's not conditioned to show but that's enough for training. Yeah. And any one of our kids or grand, well, maybe not all of our, my grandkids, but any one of our kids and my oldest grandson, we could drop them off at Super One in uh, Rath, or in, uh, not Rathrum, <laughs> Super, <laughs> Super One in Coeur d'Alene, and they could get their pigs to the scale at the fair. Like crossing government way, you know, I think Marty back there could do the same thing um, because they work with their pigs every day. So if you don't think that's possible, then that's your goal for the year. Yeah, right? it is. Because it is absolutely 100% possible. It's, it, it's just working with them. Yeah. And if you're worried about that, find a kid that knows what they're doing and ask for help. Yes. That's key. It is so important that you guys learn how to ask people who know 
for help. And any of the older 4-H kids should be happy to come help you. Anybody in our group would be happy yep. to help you. Okay, we are going to, oh, should we talk about feeding? So um, I'll do feeding because I made the little handout on feed. That's part of planning your year is deciding what, what feed you're going to feed. Um, and there's lots of different options. So depending on your goals and your budget, that's going to change a little bit on the type of food that you, you type of food that you choose. Um, and there's two kind of general ways to feed pigs. One is on an, with an on-demand uh, self-feeder and the other is where you feed them meals morning and night, um, that's called hand feeding. I don't think there's anybody that will tell you that a self feeder is better than hand feeding your animals and there's a lot of reasons for that. One, when you're feeding your animal twice a day, um, it gives you that opportunity to check on it twice a day and check for its general health. Um, the pig should get up and be hungry and come to the feeder, consume all of their feed and twice a day, like you just get very accustomed to how much they're eating and how aggressively they're eating. Um, it allows you to manipulate the amount that they're eating. Like we talked about that average daily gain, there's some pigs that just naturally grow very fast and they need to be fed less or they're gonna way outgrow your 300 pounds. Um, and there's some that you have to add some supplements to encourage them to eat or to grow. Sometimes you have to treat them for an ulcer if they're not eating, there's, there's a lot of reasons to monitor that amount of feed intake. And um, some of the pictures that Amy has are because, you know, it's easy for me to say that. My kids have individual pens for their pigs, so they go in and feed them individually and they don't have to sit and wait for them to finish. Um, but the feeding station that Amy has at her house started at our house. So you can, you can make ways to individually feed your pig that allows you to have the same results um, that don't that does not require separate pens. Or if you have um, both your pigs in one pen, you can take one out um, and yeah. let it eat while the other one's eating inside. And you There's should ways. really give them about 30 minutes to eat their food. Um, what they haven't eaten in 30 minutes, um, you remove from the pen so that they're hungry for your next feeding because you're trying to train them to eat when you feed them. Yeah, if, if, somebody, if somebody set a, a couple plates of food in front of you in the morning and said, here's your food for the day, for the day, would you want to eat that for dinner, whatever they set in front of you? I mean, not usually, you know. So they get excited when, they, when you go out there to feed them. If there's not food in front of them all day in front of a self-feeder, they get excited and want to eat. So if you have a pig that's having a, you know, doesn't really want to eat, that's usually, you know, what it is. I mean, think about if somebody set your daily ration of food in front of you for the whole day. And that so. starts when you bring them home. So if you go out there twice a day and feed, it doesn't have to look exactly like what it's gonna look like later in the year where you separate everything. But for example, we have a feeder. So we One have three pigs, pigs yeah. right? So, but, we feed a set amount of food. So for the babies, it's probably three pounds for three pigs each feeding, right? So we put that in there in the three morning. Three pounds? A pound Is per it? pig. A pound oh, per pig. okay, yeah. I thought you were saying per yeah. pig. Yeah, so that goes in there at you know, seven in the morning before the boys go to school. They might sit and scratch them and play with them a little bit and then they off to school. Seven o'clock at night, again, they bring their three pounds. So the, the pigs learn it's feeding time, it's time to eat. They're not snacking, they're not taking little bites here and there, right? So really they modify how much they're feeding by if the pigs are cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. So if there's feed left, they're giving them too much food because you want them to be hungry for the next meal. You want them to dive into their feeders and clean up what's there in about 30 minutes. And then, so if you're home and can take it away in 30 minutes, that's ideal. Um, but if not, at the for next us, time. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. only that, but that's saving you money because yeah. they're not tipping it over and wasting it all. But if you teach them how to eat when they're little, it makes it so much easier in the later part of the summer, especially if you're going to really play with their feed. This one needs a little extra something, this one. Um, teaching them to eat is key. And we've done it both ways. You know, we've um, the first several years did self feeders until yeah. school was out. 
because it just yeah. it's just very it takes discipline and and time management to get that those chores done morning and night when you're trying to get kids out out the door to school um, but we did have a situation one year where um, at weigh-in all of the pigs were the same size and we didn't know that one wasn't eating until probably a month later when he visibly looked smaller so he wasn't acting sick he didn't have diarrhea he wasn't coughing he wasn't laying under the heat lamp but he was not eating so you can't you can't monitor that unless you're unless you're feeding morning and night so we're not here to try to tell you that you can't be successful with the self feeder because you can and mm -hmm. we for we've sure done. have done it. Mm -hmm. We've done um, we've done self feeders for more than one year, but it's not the most ideal. So if you're if you're looking <coughs> for the most ideal and most efficient use of your feed, it's to feed them morning and night. Um, and then this this sheet lists several different types of feed and where to where to feed or where to find them, where to purchase them locally. Um, all of those feed companies will have um, resources on how to feed it and if you if you are new to the project getting some advice on how to adjust feed is also important kind of a generic feed for show pigs is an 18 percent protein so um, like show edge that you buy at, at North <coughs> Africa, um, that's what that feed is it's 18 percent protein it's five percent fat so that's kind of a generic for a middle of the road pig. Um, a lot of pigs will eat that their whole feeding period and be fine. And then other ones you'll have to adjust based on how they're growing. Um, but if you have if you have more questions about feed, we can answer those specifically. But um, this is a this is a summary of what's available locally for feed. And feed will vary wildly per family depending on what your goals are. And there's no truly right way or truly wrong way to do it. You do what's best for your family and best for your project. And where you um, can get the feed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will. Yeah, yeah and we, we, fed a, we fed kind of the whole range mm -hmm. of it. We started with um, Woods, Woods ground feed um, that w we bought in bulk. Um, we fed showage for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, I fed Mormons. I fed Purina. The one that we, that we like the best right now is the Linder Show feed. We just feed less of it for more gain. Mm -hmm. They just they like it, they eat it, and it and it converts very well to gain. Mm -hmm. so and a, it's more expensive, but you feed less of it. So yeah, kind of a lot of people um, look at it like, oh, it's this much, of, you know, forty-two dollars a bag or whatever, but you actually feed less of it really for the do. gain. Mm -hmm. um, we also feed Linders at our house. Yeah, those two. Um, Amy and made a lot of fun of me. She made a lot oh, of fun of me. for a long time about everything. <laughs> yeah, um, and we we, we just the started same. in very well. We started in the same place. She started how, with pigs at our house, um, and dirt pen. We did the whole thing, and then I had a slower progression. But we definitely did the self feeders, and then we did the feeding one pig out of the pen, one feed in the pen. We've fed. Yeah, like you said, Bonners, we've fed Show Right, we've fed, you know, we came up, and I also have found that I, I really like Linders. I don't see us changing anything else. We do really feed a lot less of it. Um, they like it. I haven't ever really figured out what the price per pound would be. Um, of gain. Yeah, of gain. Um, but you really do feed less of a better feed. Yeah. Um, we also feed lenders. It's it's um, and we we're not reps of lenders. We don't make any money off of lenders, but we've just used it, and all of us love it. I like it. And and it may sound expensive, but like I said, you feed less of it, and it's locally available. Yeah, it didn't used to be. So it used to be that the three of us would place a, an order at the mill just for our own personal use, but now there are several people that carry it, so you can find it if you want to. Um, does, it, does anybody else have any like specific questions that they'd like to ask? I feel like we're kind of getting long-winded. So is there anything that? Um, for the lenders, that's what we feed. Um, for people who maybe are not, are there supplements or things for their digestive that you should add to keep them eating? Yeah, so um, it's not going to be realistic or very easy to add supplements on a self-feeder. Um, I, I have done it. And Amy also made fun of me for that. 
but um, it, you just take a smaller amount of something that's very palatable to the animal and mix those supplements into it and feed it individually. So they if you, come in like, I can't remember, does Winners have like the they, gas? Yeah, they do. They have all of that it's stuff. mixed in already with the bag? Um, no, it's not mixed okay, in with yeah. the bag. Those are separate separate products. Um, I don't, I don't use their supplements that way. So that True North Feed um, has some of those show, those supplements, a joint supplement and a GI supplement. Um, those are, those are helpful to your project. They're not required. They are expensive. But if you have a, if you have a pig, they call it blow a hawk. Well, that's the rest of your summer with us with a pig that's got a sore leg. So, I, I, I'm afraid not to use it. Whether it works or not, I, I don't actually, I can't be really confident, but when it's, you have that it, kind of money tied up in a project, it's not that, it's not that much more for a little bit of, of insurance. And it's a tiny um, scoop. Um, and yeah. True North isn't the only brand. No, there's no, some other saying, ones. There too. are lots yeah. of them. Yeah. So Eddie Davis has several different types available. He has some liquid ones. He has some, um, Lindner does have one. Virtually every feed, like Mormon, Lindner, Purina, all of those show right, they'll all have a joint supplement. Um, the ProBios that you can buy at North 40 is fine for a, for a GI supplement if that's what you want to use, just those probiotics. Because um, to keep them eating is really important. Back to the Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry, Ben. So, what is the main thing that they're being judged on? So, there's two general classes at the fair. The first is judged on the animal's quality. And that means different things to different people. That day, the judge gets to decide. So he might like them with bigger bone, or he might like them with the short, you know, there's, they, they like different things. So that's kind of the beauty contest of the fair. Um, you don't have as much control over that because it's that judge's opinion, and you'll, you already have purchased your animal, so whatever animal you have, getting it fed and getting it finished and ready for the fair is, is all you'll be able to control in that in that but, class. But that's what you need to explain to him yeah. is finished. So, I think, oh, well, the finished part is, is has to do with feeding, right? So you want to be in that 230 to 300 pounds. Um, and like, um, that's where you'd need more of a, like someone to help you adjust feed. So if you're really wanting to do well in that class, it takes, it, I mean, we have someone who helps us feed, and they make adjustments every week by ounces. So like, you know, three ounces of this and two ounces of that, and we have kitchen scales out that they weigh their feed every day. So um, that's a, a, another part of identifying your goals. Like if your goal is to win a market class, that, that's, a, that's a tall order because our county's very competitive. Um, the other type of class is let's show and Let's class. stop for just just one second. On the on the quality <laughs> on the on the quality the beauty contest that she was talking about, um, there are different places that can give you feed advice, but it's really important for you to develop an eye for what is um, a finished pig, a pig that has the right amount of cover on it, fat cover that it's not too tightly muscled, that it can move freely, you know, those are all things that they're going to be looking at, you know, that the the pig is, you know, finished with the right amount of cover on it, you know, and a fat cover. But all the websites... Well, Lindner and Purina in particular have feeding advice that is free. So if you feed Lindner feed, you can send them a video and they will tell you how to adjust your feed. And this one right here, this um, Lindner show... On this. Examples of different I, types I of took things. a picture of it so you could see if you were on the right website because it's a little bit hard to find because it's older but it's still really good information and if you get to this video and you look down the right hand side there's a whole bunch of videos um, and they have examples. At, with examples mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you're feeding Lindner's feed they're talking about Lindner's feed, but if you're not feeding Lindner's feed, and they're and one of the videos is, you know, he the guy's talking and he says, I really think this pig needs 611, and he's going on and on about why it needs 611. Well, look up the 611 
feed tag right on that website. Look at 611, say, oh, 611 is this protein, this has this amount of protein, this amount of fat, and then find that within the feed that you're feeding, like if you're feeding a different brand, then find that, but watching videos like that will help you to see what they're looking for in the market class. So, so, and I'm not very good at it, so that's why I use those feeding recommendations. In very basic terms for what a 4 h is probably looking for, <clears throat> like she said, between 230 and 300 pounds, right? Well, that's a huge range. So ideal market weight is going to be 280, right? So really, as a 4 h that's what you want to strive for is 280 pounds. Now, as far as finished or, or you know, not enough finish or too much finish, <clears throat> if you really don't know what you're looking for, it's... Are they too jiggly or are they too muscled? And they really do look that way, right? So imagine somebody, an athlete who's been working out and really cutting weight. They're gonna be chiseled. They're gonna have those, those hips and you're gonna see the line, loin down the front and you're gonna see really developed shoulders. That pig's probably too tight. You'll wanna either back down on their protein or up their fat or maybe a little bit of both. Maybe you're on the other side where they're jiggling right there in the flank and their butts are jiggling a little bit and they're a little too chubby. So you wanna you know, maybe up their protein and back down on the fat a little bit. And that's the most basic way to describe it, but definitely looking at a lot of pictures of pigs that have one shows or, pay, or that these websites are showing you to get an eye for what you're looking for. Yeah. And again, have somebody that's done the project for a while come look at your pig and tell you, your leader or some somebody who's done the project longer, come look at my pig. Is he too jiggly or is he too tight? Or she or, you know. Or um, another, or another thing you can do is um, Kootenai Classic is I was a just big, gonna say big that. jackpot that's Father's Day weekend. You don't have to be, bring pigs, but oh, you can yeah. go watch. Oh, yeah. And well, go look and see what they look yeah. like in the ring. Not yeah, only. The judge the yeah. judge like. But not only that, if you can't make it to one of those jackpots, they all have. <coughs> excuse me. They all have um, a professional photographer, excuse me, <coughs> or a videographer there. So go on Kootenai Classics. Uh, Facebook page and then uh, go back and look at the photos of the pigs that are winning like you don't have to attend it's great if you can just to watch uh, but look at their videos look at their pictures watch you know go to Montana Royale's um, Facebook page go to um, what other 208, 208 208 qualifier is another local jackpot um, go and and go through their website look at their pigs and then develop an eye for yourself I mean it's nice if you can get help but ideally if you can develop that eye yourself that's it's really solid advice especially for first-year kids go watch some kids show mm -hmm. pigs go to a jackpot and just watch them show not only that you'll get lots of um, what did yes. you say? Friends. Yes. Well, that's, you know, that's the funnest thing about going to the yeah, jackpots is, is you develop a livestock best. family and, and get there, to hang out with there everybody. There are three here, so you don't even have yeah. to travel. So the 208 yeah. qualifier is the last weekend of April. Um, and then there's the Kootenai Classic, which is Father's Day weekend. And then Sandpoint is the weekend after. So for kids that are just starting, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't do Kootenai Classic. The first year we did it, we had no business being there. <laughs> um, but you learn. It's a good experience. Um, but Sandpoint is a great one. If you're going to pick beginners. one show, mm -hmm. Sandpoint or Blues Classic would be the ones I would recommend. And one of the reasons behind that is if, if you go to 208 or if you go to Kootenai Classic and you are you can't get your pig from the trailer to the um, show ring, um, they're, gonna, they're not going to wait for you. They have to keep moving. But Sandpoint will be like, we're waiting for tie knob. <laughs> yeah. And they and, are vastly and, different shows. Yeah, mm -hmm. but so, they're fun. They're all fun. But I'm just saying, fun. it's it's a good first year jackpot to go to, even uh, if you just watch. If you go to Kootenai Classic, it's a it's a great example of what the top end. The top end. Yep. And the two people come and from the all over the place. show are very family friend friendly, smaller, easy easy going days. Um, I would recommend going to both, but if you had to pick one, you know, go to the smaller show, get an idea of, um, Cooney Classic's pretty fantastic if you want to go see some kids really show some pigs. But let me just answer your other type of class. The other class is judged on the kid. Oh yeah. 
So there's the beauty contest, which is judged on the pig, and then the other one is judged on your ability to control and show your pig. That is the one, in my opinion, you have the most control over, because if you do the work at home, you're gonna do, you'll do well. You may not win everything, because not everybody gets to win, but you'll be proud of your effort, and your animal will look good, and everybody will be able to tell standing ringside that you put in the work. So it doesn't matter what your pig looks like. If they are presented well, and you have worked with it, it, it will be it will be a success. Mm -hmm. And then does that feed into the auction or is that just based off size and looks? So um, the auction, I will tell you just honestly, is who you brought to bid on your pig. So every pig in the sale will sell. And our county is very lucky to have a solid group of buyers that pay premium dollar for your pig but your job as an exhibitor is to go out and talk to businesses and find somebody who is interested in even placing one bid on your pig. Um, and that's how you sell the pig. So You're it doesn't have as much to do with your placing in showmanship or your market placing. Like, yes, Grand and Reserve is gonna sell for more because that's an advertising opportunity for those companies but the rest of the pigs, it's who you know and who you've marketed to yeah. that shows up to buy your It's, pig. it's very important to market, you know, like to go to businesses, to your dentist, to your tire shop, to whoever you do business with. You go in person with a letter, um, with the stock sale brochure so that they have the official information, but introduce yourself, tell them about your project, and, um, and, and invite, them to, invite the them to the sale. And it's never good to say, come to the sale and buy my pig. You know, it's that, you know, the more buyers that are at the sale is better for everybody. You don't have to say, come buy my pig. To, I mean, to me, that's really rude. You just say, hey, there's, you know, this is an opportunity to fill your freezer. There's kit for each kids there raising animals and, um, selling them and you can get good meat and you know just just invite them to the sale just get them in the stands and then when they do buy your pig because somebody will whether you invited them or they're just there yeah, buying animal animals your animal will sell yeah. make a relationship with your buyer right I drove a huckleberry pie to Kellogg as a thank you for somebody that bought my one of my son's pigs okay they make appreciate an, it make an effort you know, go in there and say thank you very much. Give them a buyer's gift or a thank you letter or something um, and make that relationship. So next year you can walk in there with your letter. Maybe they remember you from the year before and you've made that relationship and they'll come buy your pig again. And it's good to, when you write a letter, it's good to take a picture of you with your pig so that those like Les Schwab will be there and they have all those support letters there and they'll be like, oh, there's that that kid that sent us a letter and so to take a picture of yourself with your pig in your stock sale letter. And talk to the extension office because this year they have some really great resources. Um, there's someone doing the tech situation for the extension office. Is it you? Helping <laughs> with the QR codes. So you can create your own QR code that's attached to either a website or a YouTube page. It's the man in the back. And um, I think he's going to do that as a class. Talk to the extension office, they have all the information. Um, and that'll be a, like a new little detail that kids can do to set themselves apart. So you can do a little video that the QR code will take them to. Um, the guy in the red. Uh, anyway, um, if you're wondering what you can do to set, your, set yourself apart, that might be something. We've always made a little um, card with a picture and a, and a letter about the project of the year, that kind of thing. Um, but the biggest thing is market yourself. Yeah, market yourself. And go to, try to go to some businesses that you don't see on the buyers list because some of those buyers, most of those buyers will get a hundred invitations, literally. Try to bring in so somebody new. new. They'll have a stack of them like this. So try to try find to some, new, yeah, some new businesses. Um, we go to 20 a year. That's 10 for each kid. And I used to do 10 per kid, but I have four kids, yeah, so we so just do 30. <laughs> yeah. 30 is um, our round number, so we... We visit 30 businesses, um, and they go in and introduce themselves and, and hand their information over and give them their little speech, and um, that's, that's how you bring a buyer. And be real careful on, on how you give the gift to the buyer. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. 
<laughs> so we were, this is just a funny story. So Marty back there is my grandson's best friend. Oh, he's pretending like it's not him. So they had the grand idea at the Spokane Interstate Fair. Um, they had those gold candies, I think they're called ro something, rochures, grand yeah. rochures or something. They're like a ball. Yeah, hazelnut candy. So the idea was when somebody bid on Landon's pig, Marty was going to toss him a candy. And so I told Marty, okay, make sure that you get their eye contact first and then toss it. <laughs> well, Marty beamed the Avista guy right in the forehead. <laughs> Baseball player, right? Yeah. Memorable, though. It's baseball. memorable. All, all other baseball. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it was, a, and Avista quit bidding on his pig. But, <laughs> but it, was, it was all good. It was all good. But just be careful on how you present. It was a great idea for yeah. execution. It, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> OK, so you had a question? So on the feed, uh, we've raised pigs, but not for show. Um, you're talking about adjusting protein versus the fat content. What are you using to adjust that if you've got? Different feed. You're, so are so, you buying it a small quantity of time and then asking for a different mix then when you're trying to adjust from there? Do you have a Well, it depends on the brand that you buy. Right. Some brands like the Lindner's more Mormons have different feeds with different levels of protein and fat. So you can switch to that feed or mix them. Um, and if you're, if say you're like uh, Show Edge, okay, so we fed Show Edge for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to find a supplement to add to it to either add protein or add fat. The hardest one is if you have to lower the protein yeah. from Show Edge. Yeah. Because it's, it was only available as 18%. Right. So if right. you do need right. to lower the, then you end up mixing you it with another feed. feed. Yeah. So, so you there can either mix it with the, um, I think there's a 14% that you can find available. And so you're, you're having to do a little more work to lower the protein than just buying a different feed that's say 16% protein. So, so, there's, it's, so there's like um, other, like we don't, if we use Lindner's feed, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all use Lindner's supplements. So Eddie Davis carries like Champion, Champion, Champion Drive, Drive yeah, so which is protein. a yeah. supplement for adding protein or um, what's there's the lots fat? lots of fat supplements. Yeah. Lots of fat there's supplements, so you can add some fat to their diet. One of the things that we haven't touched on here that you'll see on show pig websites um, is people adding eggs and cake mix no, and don't all that. Do that. Don't do it. It's so, no. it doesn't get them to eat more feed. It does not get them to eat more feed. Well, that's what I was wondering is I didn't know if you used anything from you know, the home kitchen as no. a supplement. You're purchasing all that. Or I would, purchasing you know, the only thing we feed. use from our, rolled, our, our kitchen is rolled oats. Okay. We add rolled oats and that, that adds fiber and it makes the food a little more digestible. Okay. Um, yeah, you want to be careful um, because when you sign your quality assurance, yeah. you're saying that you're not you're not feeding them anything that is not designed for their consumption. So it's not that feeding them table scraps is bad for them. It, it really is not. But when you're selling that animal for someone else to consume, um, it's important that you follow those specific rules. And so when you at the at the fair, they'll you'll you'll go through a quality assurance class. And part of what you sign is that you didn't feed them any garbage, basically. Right, right. So, and it, 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 so for the pig, so you're not purchasing the entire <coughs> amount of feed in, in one. No. no. You're picking up. So no. you have separate amounts of each of these feeds on hand, right. and then you just yes. adjust accordingly. So yeah. we used to do that. We used to buy a whole pallet of, of show edge, right. Yeah. right? And then we'd get later in the year where well, this one, this gilt, because gilts tend to be more tighter, heavily muscled, um, would be too tight. She needs a little extra fat, lower protein. And this barrel is sogging out on me. He needs higher protein. So then we're stuck with show edge. Right. And for a couple of years, we just supplemented the show edge, which was fine. And you can still do that. And you yeah. can still do that. And um, I find it easier to be on a feed program that has the different options. So we'll start our year with a couple of bags of each, and it's pretty readily available in our area now through, through certain people. Um, and so doing it that way makes it easier to adjust as you go. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing it the show edge way and, and adding supplements. There's no, nothing wrong with doing that. It just makes it a little bit 
easier if you have other options readily available. And the show edge, you know, we would end up with, say, six bags left at the end of the year. We just fed that to our babies the next spring, started them on show edge, and then kind of when we saw what they needed, you know. But like um, Eddie Davis, who yeah. uh, has, yeah, uh, he's, he's, listed, he's on listed on here. He's right off of Hayden Avenue, and um, he stocks the Lindner's feed. One thing that he does like to communicate to people, I mean, because it's kind of a, you go there. It's his personal residence. It's his personal so. residence. So he might not be there when you go to get feed. So you get your feed, you write it on this board, you fill out a receipt, and you put your money in the bucket. But what he really doesn't want to happen is for, he wants you to communicate with him. Like if you are needing some, like he doesn't want to be left with a bunch of feed in September because he ordered a couple pallets of feed and then nobody bought it. Or um, because then it's gonna sit there all winter for, or, I mean nowadays there's enough p people raising pigs in the winter that it might not, but he wants you to communicate with him, say if you know that you need a certain amount um, towards closer to fair, then communicate that. He doesn't like you to go just buy one bag of feed, you know, he likes you to buy two or three bags at a time, like to plan your month out basically. You don't have to plan your year out, but but don't just go pick up a bag here and a bag there. And you wouldn't want to do that anyway. You'll be running back and forth all the yeah. time. We usually... But, but, he, but anyway, what you were talking about is, yes, the different feet, like Linder's has, he'll stock like 611, which is a higher protein. That's 23% protein. Yeah, mm -hmm. he'll stock a 685. 16%. Um, 632 has the warmer built 20. into it, which is a 20%. So he stocks all that there, and you just go, you know, he's right off of Hayden Avenue. You go pick up what you need, but just be, um, you know, like I said, communicate with him if you know you're going to need some in August. Say, I'm going to need, you know, a certain amount. So to start off with on that, then, so for the small pigs to start off with, you start with just like the, the balance that you're talking about with the 185 until you start trying to figure out what weight needs to be adjusted later on. Yeah, and um, that, as a starter for that, do you pick up a high pro, a medium, and a low pro type of a, a, a mix, and then you can adjust from there with those as you're going along? Is there? So it's hard to say. Yeah, um, I would say it depends a little bit on what your baby pig looks like. Yeah. Okay. So if you pick up a baby pig and it looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right, it does not need more protein, right, right. because it'll outgrow its skeleton. So those those pigs are so genetically now designed to muscle up that you can make them too muscled and then they, their skeleton breaks down. So a pig that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger needs to be started no more than 16% protein. And honestly, you may end up even backing down further than that depending on how it grows. Now, if you have um, just a, a pig that just looks like a regular baby pig, then yeah, the 18% is a good place to start. Um, I would say that when we very first bring them home, we probably start them on the 611, which is the 23% protein, because it's the closest to the starter feed. So the starter feed is usually a lot higher protein, so we start them kind of similar so that they want to eat, and then within a couple of weeks, then you can make an adjustment based on what they look yeah. like. The we Linder the website thing. actually recommends yeah. uh, 611 as a receiving feed for the first two weeks, because you want them to eat when you get them home. You want them to like their feed, you want them to eat, and 611 is uh, a feed that they really like. So they like, on the website, it does recommend 611 as a receiving feed for two weeks and then make your adjustments after that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We do the same thing. Okay, yeah. so any more questions? Because we're, I think it's getting kind of late. Um, so <laughs> we, like we could, <laughs> um, <laughs> Any more questions from anybody? Do you want to run over skin and hair just real quick? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. briefly, we'll do skin and hair because that was another reason we wanted to have the different options available um, because Amy is a specialist with dirt pens, really, at this point. You have to be. <laughs> um, so if you are keeping your pigs inside, they stay cleaner, but you still have to maintain skin and hair with brushing and different moisturizers. Um, uh, my kids use a product called Pre-Show that I get on Amazon. That's just a spray that they brush in. The problem with it is it is oil-based, so if you have an outdoor pen, you cannot use those products. Your pig will sunburn really badly. So if you have an outdoor pen, 
Um, she can talk about what she does when we had an outdoor pen. We would do weekly baths and then um, use lotion on them and sunscreen their white parts. So anything at the back of their ears, the back of their neck, down the back of their back, if they're out in the sun, um, you, you have to protect them from the sun. So, um, but yeah, some sort of, some sort of skin care routine when, like I said, ours are inside, so ours is pretty minimal. Um, they stay pretty clean. But if you're, if you have the majority of the situation where you're going to be in a dirt pen, um, then they have a little bit different strategies. Yeah. So, uh, first thing with a dirt pen, you have to have shade, 100%. Whether you put up a tarp, whether you have a tree, whatever, you have to have shade. And when those pigs are little, if they have white on them, sunscreen them. So ours, we sunscreen them and then the dirt sticks to it. Um, and for the first little while, they'll get a little sunburn behind their ears, but you do not want them to sunburn. It'll cause, they can get staph infections from the sunburn. It's terrible. They can't, you know, sometimes their back legs will stop working. Like they really protect them from the sun for the first little while. Even if you just and have to take- they lay in the sun. Like they on do. Purpose, they'll go lay in the sun. <laughs> Handfuls of mud on, mud on them, on them whatever. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll the stickier SPF. the better. The big, um, yeah. I just, I just, you know, we just bought the whatever was cheapest, like yeah. at Target, the no ad. You're gonna want to probably just like you would with your kid over 30 SPF. So the sunscreen um, isn't what's really working. The stickiness of the sunscreen to keep the dirt on the pig is what'll protect them. You can so also just pack them out on them. Really, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you might have to sunscreen them every day depending on what your situation is. Um, it's best to give them shade, keep them out. Yeah, they really do need shade. Um, so I have found that, that dark-skinned pigs and, and light-skinned pigs have different skin, different kind of skin. The dark, the dark skin tends to get flakier, drier, stays real dry, gets real kind of crusty on it. Those you need to brush every single day. You need to get a, a, a good brush with nice stiff bristles, not too stiff. And if you're scrubbing in them in one place, you will scrub the, the skin off. So be careful. But brushing that skin every day and getting those chunks of dry skin off will really improve your skin, your pig's skin health. You can get any kind of cheap lotion, mix it in a spray bottle with water, spray them down. It'll make your life so much easier when you go to clean your pig for fair if you're doing that. If, even if it's the last couple of weeks before fair, that dry skin, you'll see it real patchy on there if you wash your pig and leave it on there. So spray them every day with lotion, brush them down. It's great for you to bond with your pig anyway. The lighter skin pigs don't seem to have that dry skin problem, so we don't really worry about that at all with them. Um, as far as getting the dirt off your pig before you go to fair, okay, or a show, it takes more work if you have a dirt pen but I tell you, you can have a white, whitest white pig at fair and the cleanest looking pig if you are willing to put in the work, but it takes more than a day. Mineral oil is your best friend. Get it? Um, two nights before you take your pig anywhere, you're gonna rinse your pig off, get all the dirt and chunks off. You're gonna cover your pig in mineral oil after the sun is not shining on them because you will overheat them and you will burn them. If you mineral oil them, you have to wash them the next morning, period. But that mineral oil will pull all that dirt out of their little cracks and crevices and make it very, very washable, okay? Um, I like, um, what's the soap I use? I forget what it's called. Orvis. Orvis. I like Orvis. You can buy one tub of it. It'll last you your entire 4-H career. Because each time you wash your pig, you're going to use about a quarter to a 50 cent piece and no more or you will be washing soap off of that pig for the rest of your life okay I like um, one of those handheld scrub brushes um, they have the one handle that comes up over your hand they're plastic not plastic bristles they have to be the hair bristles but they're pretty sturdy and <clears throat> that's what we use but you have to be careful you're not like scrubbing in one place and there will be people that have told me you shouldn't use that on a pig oh no i use them on a pig but you have to be careful because you will if you're sitting in one spot you will scrub the skin off and it'll be a bad deal so you just want to give them a good once over 
and you're going to do that same thing two days in a row. If you have to put them back in the dirt, put them back in the dirt. Put sunscreen on them, do the same thing the next night. Put mineral oil, wash them in the morning, okay? That will get all of that dirt and staining off of your pig before you go to fair. If you have the option of washing them like that and throwing them in a horse trailer, the better off it will be, okay? But we have, we have definitely done it where we've taken white pigs, mineral oiled them, washed them in the morning, thrown them back in the dirt, mineral oil, throw them back in the dirt, wash them in the morning, throw them in, and we go to fair like that, okay? And they will be clean as a whistle. Um, I do want to say something about brushes. You, when they're babies, you want to start out with a soft brush yeah. and work your way up to like a rice root brush. They have stiff bristles, and one of the good things, like she said, you don't want to scrub the skin off of them, but when you use a right rice root brush, it toughens up their skin so that if you do have a white pig, it keeps them from, like, not that you should be whipping your pig hard enough to leave a mark, but white pigs sometimes get those marks yeah, on their yeah. bellies. If you toughen up their skin with the rice root brush, not the day before fair, but all summer long, um, it keeps the dead skin off, it toughens up their skin, and you don't see those red marks and if as you, much. I took pictures of, of all these brushes. I was going to put them up on the screen, but we couldn't get to work. If you want to come ask me after, I'll show you all the products that we're talking about. And um, where to get them. Um, so if you go to a jackpot, there's usually a Sullivan trailer there with all sorts of fun things to buy. So go to a jackpot just to go buy from the Sullivan trailer. You know me by name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They sell them trailers there usually all weekend at those shows, and uh, they have lots of, they have whips, good price on show sticks, um, uh, pr you know, all the product you could want, brushes. Okay, question? If you don't have, like, some livestock washers, mm -hmm. how exactly should you wash them? So we started out with um, pallets with are tea you, posts down in them are you to make a wash, wash rack, rack? Or, a, or like a sprayer just like overall washing yeah, yeah so you need them to be contained or you're going to chase them with a hose okay. once in a while so, once they know that, like they do learn to like the yeah. bath but at yeah. first they don't and it. and think about if they're pretty sensitive to the water so if you've got well water and it's coming out of the hose you need to be quite quick with it because cold is cold whether <laughs> you're a pig or not and they'll get tired of it you know so uh, we always walk our pigs first so they're nice and hot, so they're ready for a bath. Um, but we started with pallets with T-posts holding them together. And we would close the little pallet door and we'd wash our pigs in there, right? That's what we started with. Put a piece of plywood down so the mud's not splashing up on their legs. Um, we have graduated to the back end of our horse trailer. We have a, you know, we have a 22 foot horse trailer, so we have the middle closed. We close that, we put all the pigs in there at once and we wash them all together. Um, if you have a calmer pig, they love it. The, yeah, you can wash you're them scrubbing on the their bellies, they they're it. laying upside yeah. down, you're inside one, their one feet. One thing that they I will tell it. you is probably worth the investment is you can buy an instant hot camp shower on Amazon for less than $200, $150. Um, that makes the water warm. <laughs> And yeah, but they like the cold water. No, I, I, not, not I mean, not water. in April, but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. one of the <laughs> things I want to highly recommend is kids don't understand to get um, in the cracks of between the their yes. uh, between their yeah. belly uh, to get the soap out. If yeah. a lot of times you'll you'll they're done washing them, and if you actually go stick your hand in that kind of like their armpit, I guess front and back, um, you don't want soap suds in there. Like visualize you having to walk around all day with soap in your armpits. We have had them so, get actually yeast infections. So in make sure you get the hose in there and rinse that out. Um, I do want to bring up a point real fast. On the very first website that we put on the educational, the Showmaker, wait, which one was this one? Yeah, that's right. The Showmaker. So this is a good weight management tool. Um, it talks about um, how to, how much, like if your pig weighs a certain amount and you're feeding it how, this much, um, how much it will gain from, you know, the feed conversion depending on how old it is and, um, and its weight. So this is a good one to look at on the first website.
And then we can also just wrap it up and we can stay for a little bit longer if, if people want to have more specific questions. People, people who are all done can take off. And yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh wait, what? Oh, so if you didn't sign on your way in, you could sign the sheet on the way out.